In this video, I'll be looking at some non-calculator topics that always seem to come up in the non-calculator exam questions for the GCSE higher specification. The new specification started in 2017, and since then there have been three sets of summer exams and three sets of reset exams. I had a look at all of the non-calculator papers from all of those sets of exams, and these are the topics that I saw came up in pretty much all of the non-calculator papers. Now, of course, this does not guarantee that they'll come up in the next set of exams, but it gives a pretty high chance. And that's all we're really doing here is guessing, but it's an educated guess. So the topics are ratio, algebraic proof, index laws, probability, and vector geometry. And I'm going to go ahead and look at some example questions that you can have a go at to revise. So the first topic of ratio, we have some example questions here. These are two from the June 2018 paper one. Now I'm not going to go through all of these questions in great detail because I've already done walkthroughs of these papers. If you want to see the really detailed explanation of these questions, check out the, the walkthroughs that I've done. But just quickly, let's run through some of these examples. Uh, so the, this question here says, in a village, the number of houses, the number of flats is seven to four. The number of flats, the number of bungalows is eight to five. There are 50 bungalows. How many houses are there in the village? For this one, you need to use equivalent ratios. So if you have a ratio of eight to five, and this uh, number here represents bungalows, you can write an equivalent ratio that represents that 50 in that ratio. So if we multiply this by 10, this will be 80 to 50. And then that tells you that the number of flats is 80 because they've told you there are 50 bungalows. So there must be 80 flats. And then you write an equivalent ratio for the first ratio of houses to flats. So seven to four, that four, I need to convert to 80. So I need to multiply this by 20. This would be seven times 20 is 140 to 80, 140 that gives you the number of houses. So that was how to approach that question. The next one, the perimeter of a right angle triangle is seven, uh, 72 centimeters. The length of the sides are in the ratio three to four to five. Work out the area of the triangle. Again, let's run through it quickly. And really the, the purpose of this is to give you questions to revise. Uh, so really have a go at these before I run through them. And I'll just give a brief summary. Uh, but if you want like a really detailed explanation of these questions, again, go ahead and watch my walkthroughs of these papers. I'll have the links in the description. So draw a diagram to yourself. Uh, write the ratio of the sides, three to four to five. The longest side must be five, of course. That's a hypotenuse. If the perimeter is 72, this is like sharing an amount into a ratio. So we want to share that 72 into this ratio, three to four to five. You need to add up these numbers. Three plus four plus five is uh, 12. So 72 divided by 12 is six. And then you can work out the actual side length. So four times six is 24 centimeters. Three times six is 18 centimeters. And then you can go ahead and work out the area. So you know how to work out the area of a triangle. Okay, uh, let's have a look at some more ratios questions. This was from June, 2019. This is fairly long winded. It tells you the number of pens in each pack and then the ratio of the packs. You need to convert that ratio in terms of pens. So if there was two pens in each pack of black pens, multiply that by two, uh, 14, five pens in each pack of red pens, that would be 15, and then four, six pens in each pack of green pens, four times six is 24. Then th again, this is like a sharing into a ratios question. If you know there are 212 pens sold, add up the total of that ratio, uh, divide 212 by that total. So the number of parts here, number of parts is 14 plus 15 plus 24 is 53. 212 divided by 53 is four. And then multiply the number relating to green pens by four. 24 divided, uh, multiplied by four is 96. Okay, then question 17, this was also from June, 2019. Uh, now this is, it starts off as a ratios question. It, re it presents the problem as a ratio, uh, but what you need to know here is that you can write ratios as fractions. So I would suggest writing this ratio as x squared over three x plus five. 
uh, equal to 1 over 2 and then it becomes an algebraic fractions problem. Uh, so it's not really a ratios question but I included it here because it does have that aspect of ratios in it. You need to understand that you can always write ratios as fractions and then you could go ahead and solve that. Uh, again I won't go through this here, I'll let you do that yourself and if you want to check the solutions as I've already said check the exam walkthroughs. Uh, more ratios questions, this is from November 2019, uh, this was about people in a choir, there are 60 people in the choir, half of the people are women, so that means there are 30 women, the number of the women in the choir is 3 times the number of men, that means, well oh, that's meant to be 30, well 3 times what is 30, that's 10, 10 men, the rest of the people in the choir are children, and you need to write that in the ratio n to 1, the children to men. Uh, well, if there's 30 women, 10 men, and 60 people, that means there's 20 children. You need to uh, write this ratio, children to men, which is 20 to 10, in the form n to 1. Well, divide that by 10, it'd be 2 to 1. So the answer there is 2. Uh, so that was like uh, converting, basically converting words into numbers, really. Uh, you just, as soon as you write that down, that ratio 20 to 10, hopefully you would see divide by 10 and you get your answer. Um, June 2017, this is an example from that paper. This was a four mark question. I would say this is harder than this one, although they're equivalent in marks. Um, so it's interesting how they can, uh, you know, distribute the marks of these types of questions. But uh, this one said, white shapes and black shapes are used in a game, some of the shapes are circles, all of the shapes are squares, the ratio of the white to the black shapes is 3 to 7, the ratio of the white circles to white squares is 4 to 5, the ratio of the black circles to black squares is 2 to 5, work out the fraction of all the shapes are circles. So I believe I originally explained this using rectangles, and I think that's a sort of a nice way to picture it. That is not a rectangle, let me do that again. Okay, that's meant to be a rectangle. So this is a white shapes to black shapes is 3 to 7. And then we had the ratio of white circles to white squares, 4 to 5. So we had a little section here relating to white shapes uh, in terms of circles and squares, 4 to 5. And then this part was the black shapes and that's black circles to black squares is 2 to 5 and then work out the fraction of all the shapes of circles that was these sections here and then uh, well I would use fractions here so I would say uh, 4 ninths of 3 tenths that's that fraction, right? This is this part of the rectangle is three tenths of the total, so it's four ninths of three tenths, and then this fraction is two sevenths, so we add that on two sevenths of seven tenths, and then you go ahead and simplify this. And here I would do some cancelling. Uh, now, when you're multiplying fractions, you can cancel, not when you're adding. So you can cancel these fractions in here and these ones in here, but not when you're adding them. So you could cancel this 4 with this 10, common factor of 2, and this 3 with this 9, and then this these fractions here, you could again cancel the 2 with 10, and the 7's cancel to 1. So with that cancelling, it simplifies it a bit. So this first two fractions, that would be 2 times 1 is 2 on 3 times 5 is 15, plus 1 on 5. It makes it a bit easier when you do that cancelling. So 2 fifteenths plus 1 fifth. Uh, multiply that by 3 to have the common denominator. This would be 2 fifteenths plus 3 fifths, which is uh, 3 fifteenths, sorry, 5 on 15, which is a third, which if I haven't made any errors there would be the final answer. Okay. This is, question is from November 2017, non-calculator paper. Kara is seven years older than Jay. Martha is twice as old as Kara. The sum of their three ages is 77. Work out the ratio of Jay's age to Kara's age to Martha's age. 
so this is not really a ratios question because it's uh, more of an algebra question. You need to create or write these ages in terms of some unknown. So if you let J's age be X, Kiara is seven years older than J, so she would be X plus seven. Uh, Martha is twice as old as Kiara, that's two times Kiara's age, which we said is X plus seven, so it'd be two times X plus seven. And then you have, uh, you, you can create an equation and solve that for X. So you'd add those up and it would equal 77 and then solve for X. But you just need to remember to represent that final uh, answer as a ratio. So again, not completely a ratios question. I included it here because because it has that as aspect of ratio in it. Okay, some more examples. Okay, this was actually from a calculator paper, but it was similar to it was similar to this question here from uh, 2017, uh, the 2017 non-calculated paper. So I included it here. This was from the 2019 exams, um, and it says you have some cubes in a bag. Some are red and some are yellow. The ratio of small cubes to large cubes is four to seven. The ratio of red cubes to yellow cubes is three to five. Why is the least number of cubes 88? Well, here you needed to add the parts in the ratio. This was 11, this was eight. And the lowest common multiple of that is 88. Uh, so that was the explanation there. It's the lowest common multiple. Uh, all of the small cubes yellow work out the least number of yellow cubes in the bag. This was a three mark question. For this one, you needed to use equivalent ratios again. So if the least number of cubes is 88, you need to represent these ratios as a ratio with a total of 88. Uh, so you'd multiply this one by eight. This would be 32 to 56. So multiplying that one by the total of the other ratio, three to five, multiply that by 11, that would be 33 to 55. So these are the least possible amounts of cubes. Uh, and this one, remember, was small cubes to large cubes. And they tell us all of the small cubes are yellow. So these 32 cubes are all yellow. And this number in this ratio represented yellow cubes as well. Um, so what's the least possible number of large yellow cubes? Well, I should have said these were small, small and yellow. If there are 32 small and yellow cubes and 55 cubes in total, you can uh, subtract those. So 55 take 32 is 23. So that was the approach to that question. A little bit of a tricky one there. Um, I don't know why I think that's tricky. I think it's just the way it's worded, sort of confusing. But yeah, so that was all of the ratios questions I could find in the non-calculated papers. Um, a good topic to revise. On to algebraic proof. As you can see, this has come up in the 2017 non-calculated paper, 2018 and 2019 non-calculated papers. That gives a pretty good chance that it will come up in the next set of exams. So there are some useful uh, things to keep in mind with these types of questions, which I'll run through as we go through the, the problems. First one says, prove that the square of an odd number is always one more than the multiple of four. Here you need to understand how to represent odd and even numbers algebraically. So usually we say that an even number can be represented as 2n because an even number is always a multiple of 2. So whatever n is here, uh, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 3 is 6, that will always be an even number. An odd number is always one more than this, so 2n plus 1. So 2 times 3 is 6 plus 1 is 7. That will give you an odd number. You can also do 2n take 1. Uh, that will work as well. So 2n plus 1 or 2n take 1 uh, is the expression you can use to represent an odd number. And here we're asked to prove that the square of an odd number is something. So what we want to do is to square this expression. So 2n plus 1 squared. Um, and then expand those brackets and simplify. So this, if you square these brackets, you get 4n squared plus 4n plus one, and then factor the first two terms. This would be four times n squared plus n plus one. And what this tells you is that this first term 
is always a multiple of 4 because whatever n is here, we're multiplying it by 4, it must be a multiple of 4, and then we're adding 1 on. So by uh, representing an odd number algebraically, squaring it, you end up with this, and basically you've answered the question. You just need to then state, therefore, uh, you know, an odd number squared is always a multiple of 4 plus 1. Okay, question 13 here from 2019 says, given that n can be any integer greater than 1, prove that n squared taken is never an odd number. Here you need to understand something about multiplying odd and even numbers. So you can take this expression, n squared take n, and factorize n out. It would be n times n take 1. And you need to know that when you multiply an odd and an even number, it will always be even. Multiplying anything by an even number will give you an even result. So for example, uh, 3 times 2 is 6, that's even. Uh, you know, 5 times 2 is 10, that's even. Anytime you multiply by an even number, you get an even number. Now looking at this expression, if n is even, n take 1 will be odd. If n is odd, n take 1 will be even. So in this case, n times n take 1 must be even. Um, so that fact there would help you with these types of questions. From 2017, we had this question, n is an integer greater than 1, prove algebraically that n squared take 2 take n take 2 all squared is always an even number. Here you need to simplify this expression, so you know expand those squared brackets, this will be n squared take 2 take n squared take uh, 4n plus 4 and keep that in brackets because that negative needs to be distributed to all of those terms. So do that next. This will be n squared take 2 take n squared plus 4n take 4 um, and then simplify so those n squareds would cancel and we are left with uh, 4n take 6 Factor 2 out, this will be 2 times n take 3, uh, 2n take 3. And remember what we're saying about even numbers, anything multiplied by 2 is even, therefore this is always even. Um, so you can see a common theme here is understanding something about odd and even numbers, how to represent them algebraically, and also you know what you get when you multiply them. The last one n is integer, prove algebraically that the sum of half n times n plus 1 and half n plus 1 n plus 2 is always a square number. Just a quick reminder, give these a go yourself. Pause the video on each question before I go through them. Okay, so here I would factorize out at half n plus 1. Half n plus 1 from both terms. Uh, because we're adding them, we would add these. And then if we factorize out half n plus 1, we're left with um, sorry, n, because we factorize the half, so we're left with n in the first term, plus n plus 2 in the second term. So next, this equals a half times n plus 1 multiplied by 2n plus 2. If I multiply this second bracket by half, I get n plus 1 times n plus 1, which is n plus 1 squared. Whatever n is, we're going to square it and we'll get a square number. So this proves that this expression or the sum of these expressions is always a square number. So they were all the algebraic proof questions from non-calculator papers. Just a couple more things on this odd and even numbers idea. So we've already said odd times even is even. You also need to know that an odd number times an odd number is odd always odd. Um, so that's the only time you get an odd number from the product of two other numbers. For example, 3 times 5 is 15, that's odd. Um, 3 times 7 is 21, that's odd. So you need to understand when you multiply odd and even numbers, you also need to understand when you add odd and even numbers. So an odd number plus an even number is odd. For example, 3 plus 6 is 9. And then odd plus odd is even. For example, 3 plus 3 is 6, or 7 plus 3 is 10. And then also even plus even is even. And also this works when you subtract as well. So odd plus or minus an even number is odd. 
odd plus or minus an odd number is even. And yeah, that's, and then even plus even is even as well. Okay, so hopefully those ideas come in handy. Next was index laws. This is almost a guarantee that this will come up in the non-calculator uh, papers. Let's just have a quick look at all of the questions. So lots of index laws questions. Uh, you start learning about index laws from about grade eight. So I'm hoping you're really, really confident with index laws. Uh, I won't run through all of these, but just quickly when you have a power of a half, that's the square root. So 36 to the power of a half is square root of 36 is six. To the power of zero, anything to the power of zero is one. Uh, then when you have fractional powers, the numerator, think of that as the power and the denominator as the root. And then if it's negative, that's one over that thing. So I would start off by writing this as one over 27 to the power of two on three. So that accounts for the negative. And then think about this fraction. As I said, the two is the power, the three is the root. So this is one on the cube root of 27, all squared. And yes, this is a non-calculator paper. You need to know cube roots and fourth roots of common numbers. So the cube root of 27 is three. So this is one over three squared, which is one over nine. That will be your final answer there. Some more examples. This was from a non-calculator paper, but just, you know, it's a good example of index laws. M to the power three times N to the power four. Add those exponents, M to the power seven. When you have it in brackets, you multiply that power. So five cubed is 125 N cubed. Just write that as N cubed and P to the power three to the power of three is P to the power of nine. That's three times three. When you have fractions with the same base, you subtract the powers. 32 on four is eight. Q to the power nine on Q to the three is Q to the power six. Nine take three and then four take one is three. So that's R to the power three. Okay, hopefully this is all revision and you're really confident on these topics. If not, now's the time to practice. Uh, so here, work out the value of this expression, uh, non-calculator, so I'd suggest just using index laws. Seven plus negative two is three to the power five. On three to the power three, subtract those powers, that's three squared, and your final answer would be nine there. Here we have six on 81 to the power of three on four. That, that power is distributed to both of those numbers in the fraction. So this is 16 to the power of three on four on 81 to the power of three on four. Again, the three is the power, the four is the root. Here is where you need to know your fourth root of these numbers. So it's the fourth root of 81, fourth root of 16 cubed on the fourth root of 81 cubed. 4th root of 16 is 2, so it's 2 cubed. The 4th root of 81, you need to think what number times itself 4 times equals 81. 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 is 81, so this is 3 cubed. And then this simplifies to 8 on 27. So you do need to know powers of 4, powers of 3 for the non-calculator papers. This is uh, about as difficult as these index laws questions get. Uh, so this says three to the power A equals one on nine, three to the power B equals nine root three, three to the power C equals one on root three, work out the value of A plus B plus C. So you need to work out these exponents. What exponent would three have to equal one on nine? Well, nine we can write as one on three squared. And then because it's one over that thing, we can write it as three to the power of negative two. So that exponent, um, a, I should have written there, A, it will be equal negative two. Um, so we're sort of working backwards in a way to work out that exponent. Next for B, you need to think, how could you write that number nine root three as a number base three? So nine root three, you could write as three squared times three to the power of a half. And then adding those exponents, you get three to the power of five on two or two and a half. Okay, so then B equals five on two. Um, so B equals five on two. And then C, one on root three, 
running out of room here. 1 on root 3 is 3 to the power of negative a half. So C is negative a half. Once you've worked out A, B, and C, work out the sum of those things. And have you got the answer yet? Have you worked it out? Hopefully you got a final answer of 0. Well done if you got that. Okay, more index laws questions. P to the power of 2 to the power of 5, what is that? Hopefully you said P to the power of 10. Well done if you did. These types of questions I would write it as a fraction. So 12x to the power of 7y cubed over 6x cubed y. And then it's just the same thing as this question up here we did. So divide the numbers. 12 divided by 6 is 2. 7 take 3 is 4. And 3 take 1 is 2. Okay, this is a, another fairly tricky one. Uh, you need to write all of these numbers as base 3 to work out x. Um, so 3 to the power of negative a half is like 3 squared to the power of negative a half. So, all right, let's just take a couple more steps to do this. You notice I put the 3 squared in brackets. That's the same thing as saying 9 to the power of negative a half. I've just written 3 squared. Um, because I want to write all of these things as base 3. And you'll see why in a minute. So 3 squared to the power of negative half is the same thing as 3 to the power of negative 1. 9 to the power of negative half is the same as 3 to the power of negative 1. And they've told us this equals 27 to the power of a quarter divided by 3 to the power of x plus 1. So here you want to write 27 as a number base 3. This would equal 3 cubed. Uh, in other words, 3 to the power of 3 quarters. If you write that as 3 cubed, multiply it by a quarter, you get 3 quarters over 3 to the power of x plus 1. And then you want to create an equation with these index numbers. So subtract these. So we get 3 quarters take x plus 1 equal to negative 1 and then solve that equation. And you should end up with x equal to, drum roll, 3 quarters, yes. So final answer there was 3 quarters. That was from uh, November 2019. Uh, so apologies, I don't have a detailed walkthrough of this paper yet. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to post that yet. But hopefully that gave you a general idea of how to answer that. Uh, November 2017, again we have that power of a half. That's the square root of 100. And the square root of 100 is... 10 and then 125 to the power of 2 on 3 again 2 is the power 3 is the root the cube root of 125 is 5 and then we square that so final answer is 25 there a couple questions from june 2017 81 to the power of negative a half is 1 on the square root of 81 so 1 on 9 and then this one remember to distribute that power to both numbers in the fraction 64 to the power of 2 on 3 is the cube root of 64. What's the cube root of 64? That's 4 squared, uh, squared because we have that 2. And then the cube root of 125 is 5, and we square that as well. So final answer here would be 16 on 25. And that was all of the index laws questions. Okay, so fairly confident that will come up in a non-calculator exam. If not, it's almost certain that it will come up in papers two or three. So even if you revise it for paper one, it doesn't come up. You know, it's not wasted time because it will likely come up in the other papers. Okay, the next topic was probability. Uh, there are quite a few questions on probability from these exams. Um, so the first one from 2018, paper one. I know I'm running through these questions fairly quickly, but I didn't want this video to take forever and the main point is just to give you some questions to revise and some topics to revise. So uh, this question here said the number of red counters and the number of blue counters was 3 to 17. And then there's also purple counters. Uh, and the probability of a purple counter is 0.2. That means the red and blue counters take up 80% of the counters in the bag. So the question was to work out the probability that Sam takes a red counter. And this is sort of a mix between ratios and probability. Here you can use the idea of sharing into a ratio. So if this ratio represents 80%, uh, 
uh, you can find the total parts. So there's 20 parts in this ratio. Divide 80% by 20. That means each part in this ratio is worth 4%. So this 3, if we multiply that by 4, that would be 12 um, to, what would this be, 68. So that the three parts of that ratio representing the red counters would be 12% uh, of the total. Um, so you could use sharing into ratios. You can also uh, use multiplying fractions. So if so, you could represent this as a proportion: three out of twenty counters are red, and then multiply that by eighty percent. So eighty on one hundred, and then simplify that. You'll get twelve on one hundred. So, anyways, final answer there is twelve percent. And there are a couple methods to attack that one. Another question from uh, November twenty eighteen the non-calculated paper. This was a six mark question, so I won't run through the whole solution here. I have worked solutions to these papers that I'll link in the description. Um, I think, what was the general approach? So there were three more blue pens and green pens. Okay, so you had to represent the number of green pens as G and the number of blue pens as G plus three. And the probability uh, that Simon takes two pens of the same color as 27 on 55, you needed to work out the probability of a green and a green pen being pe picked or a blue and a blue pen being picked. And then, you know, create an equation equal to 27 on 55. But yeah, check out my work solutions for that one in detail. Uh, this is a couple of questions from June 2019. The first one gave a table you had to fill out, so there are blue, only blue, red, and yellow cubes in the box. Uh, you need to understand that probabilities add up to one for all of the thing, all of the total of the events. So if they tell you there are the same number of red and yellow cubes, you need you know they need to add up to 0.8. So that would be 0.4 and 0.4. And then if there are 12 blue cubes in the box, what is the total number of cubes? Well, if, if 12 represents 20%, uh, what would be 100%? Multiply that by 5. 12 times 5 is 60. Okay. Then question 22. This was also from uh, June 2019. This was a five mark question, another fairly long question. And there are a couple ways you can solve this. You can solve it using you know, setting up fractions like in this question, or you can use ratios. So because they tell you the number of, uh, the probability the counter is green is three on seven, you can say the ratio of green counters to red counters is three to four. That will give you a probability of three out of seven. And then they tell you they add two more red counters and three more green counters, and the new probability is six on 13. Well, then you can say, well, if I multiplied this by some number, I would have the actual number of counters in the bag. So you can multiply this by X. So three X would represent the number of green counters, and four X would represent the number of red counters. And then we add on, uh, 3 and 4x plus 2 for the red counters because there are two more red counters. This equals 6 on 13. And then you need to solve that equation for x. Um, so you can use ratios there as well. And I have a video walkthrough of those questions if you want to check that one out in detail. Okay, a couple more probability questions. You can see this is a fairly common topic in non-calculator exams. Uh, this was from November 2019. There are P counters in the bag. 12 of the counters are yellow. I've already written the answer here for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but it says Shafiq takes a random 30 counters from the bag. Five of these 30 counters are yellow. Five out of 30 are yellow. This simplifies to one on six. So approximately one on six of the counters are yellow. P is the number of counters in the bag. If there are 12 yellow counters, that re represents one sixth. So, you know, what would be the total? So 12 out of what? Basically you're doing 12 times six, so that'd be 72. So that's how you get the final answer there. June 2017, there are nine counters in a bag. Seven of the counters are green, two of the counters are blue. Rhea takes a random two counters from the bag. Work out the probability. Rhea takes one counter of each color. You must show you're working. Here, there are no 
unknowns to solve for, which is nice. You just need to know how to work out probabilities. Um, so to work out the probability that she takes one of each color, we could get a green counter first and then a blue counter second, or we could get a blue counter first and a green counter second. You need to consider both of those possibilities and then add them. Um, so a green and then a blue would be uh, seven out of nine multiplied by two out of eight, because if you take a counter out, the total reduces by one. So that's an important point to remember. Then a blue, then a green would be two out of nine multiplied by seven out of eight, and then solve this. Um, so once you've simplified this, do some multiplying, do some adding, and what did you get for a final answer? Hopefully you got 28 out of 72, and you can also simplify this to seven out of 18, but it doesn't say to simplify, so you could leave the answer as 28 out of 72 if you want to. Okay, all right, so that was all of the examples of probability questions. Then lastly, vector geometry. Now, there were only two non-calculated papers with vector geometry questions in them. Um, so it's not specifically a non-calculator, or it's not commonly a non-calculator question, but it can come up and it's likely to come up in at least one of the papers. So either papers two or three might also have vector geometry questions. So what, what I'm saying here is, yes, it might come up in non-calculator, but it's a good topic to revise because it will likely come up in one of the three papers. And these are just two examples of questions that came up in non-calculator papers. So this was from June 2017, probably one of the hardest non-calculated papers to date of the new specification. That was sort of a classic when it came out, had a lot of difficult questions in it. This one being no exception, it says this is a parallelogram. We have the vectors A and C. X is the midpoint of AC. You had to draw this line in here. Oops. Okay. And then uh, X is the midpoint. Okay. It's not working properly, but you get the idea. X is the midpoint. OCD is a straight line, so you had to draw another line out here representing CD. D is out here somewhere. And then uh, that's a straight line in the ratio K to 1. And then XD has a vector of 3C take a half A. So this line here is represented by this vector. So I'll pause just for a second to give you a go if you haven't done this question before. Okay, so what I would do is draw a little line in here to represent a half, a negative a half a, and then you know from this point to d is 3c, because xd is negative a half a plus 3c, so this length is 3c, and also because x is the midpoint of ac, it also must be the midpoint of oc, so this length is a half. C. That means CD, this length, can you see what that would be? Well, if the total from this point to D is 3C, this is a half C, this must be 2.5C. And we want that ratio of OC to CD, OC to CD uh, equals, now we can say that it's C to 2.5C, C to 2.5C or we could also write that as 1 to 2.5. Now, in the question, this part represents 1. So you need to understand how to convert this ratio from 1 being on this side to 1 being on the other side. So you need to divide by 2.5. And then 1 divided by 2.5, you might find easier if you write that as a fraction. It's a uh, 2 on 5. So what I did there was 2.5 is the same as 5 on 2, and then I did 1 divided by 5 on 2, which is 2, 2 on 5. So the final answer there is 2 on 5 for K. And then the other non-calculator example was this one here from November 2018. This was a tricky 5 mark question. It says OAB is a triangle, OPM 
and APN are straight lines. M is the midpoint of AB. OA equals A, so this is the vector A. OB equals B. OP to PM is 3 to 2, so this line is split up in the ratio 3 to 2. Work out the ratio of ON to NB. So that's these lines here, ON to NB. What I did here was to say that if M is the midpoint of AB, it's also the midpoint of OA. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, obvious or not, but anytime you draw a triangle, so whatever triangle you draw, if you pick a point that is the midpoint of one side, it's also the midpoint. If you draw a parallel line, it's also the midpoint of the other side. Um, but you can also just sort of find AB and then work it out that way. But anyways, that was my starting point. So this is a half, a negative half A. And then I split this length into two parts. Now, if this line OP to PM is split up in the ratio 3 to 2, so is this section here. Um, so this would be 2 uh, two fifths of a half because this length is also negative a half A. So this is 2 fifths of a half, that's uh, 2 negative 2 tenths of A, this little part here. So to this point down here, it's negative half and negative 2 on 10, that's negative 7 on 10 to this point. Uh, why did I do all that? It's to find AP. Okay, so AP, this is my starting point. AP equals negative 7 on 10 A plus this section. And this line is parallel to B and it's 3 fifths of a half of B. So this part will be 3 tenths of B. Possibly it's easier if you find OM first and then it's clearer where you get these fractions from. But regardless, you should get to a point where you find AP is this. Then what I did was to factorize out 7 tenths. Um, and I'll explain why I do that in a minute. So factorizing 7 tenths gets negative A. And then 3 tenths divided by 7 tenths is 3 on 7B. So the operation I did there was 3 on 10 divided by 7 on 10 to factorize that. Uh, that common factor out. Um, this is 3 on 10 multiplied by 10 on 7, which equals 3 on 7. Okay, and then I found AN. And AN is negative A. So, o, so AO is negative A. And then ON is some multiple of B because OB is B. So it's negative A plus KB. And now because AP and AN are on the same straight line, they must be multiples of each other. Um, and we can see AP is 7 tenths of AN because this coefficient of A is the same. So then we can say K in this expression is 3 on 7. So this ON, this section of this vector is 3 on 7B. Um, which means this is 4 on 7B, and then you can see the ratio of ON to NB is 3 to 4. Um, so that is how I solved that one. Lots of other methods to do these types of vector geometry questions. There are lots of examples of these questions in calculator papers. I just pulled out a couple of questions from non-calculator papers uh, to give you an idea. But if you want more revision on vectors, and vector geometry. I have a video on vector geometry. I'll link that in the description as well. And also have walkthroughs of all of these papers uh, besides a couple of the November papers. I have worked solutions for the November 2018 papers, as I've said a couple of times. Okay, so I hope you found that useful. Uh, again, they're the five topics that you're pretty much guaranteed will come up in the non-calculator papers. When I say guaranteed, you know, it's really a best guess, an educated guess of what we think might come up. So ratio, algebraic proof, index laws, probability, vector geometry, really good topics to revise. Please leave a like if you found this useful and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.